Good morning, good morning. My name is Toyan, your host of Productivity Mastery. As you know, we are bringing you some of the most inspiring leaders out there. We talk about productivity, performance, culture, leadership, and I have just the right person for the job this morning. At least it's morning here with us. I don't know where you guys are. What time are you listening to the podcast in your time zone? But uh, I'm here with Lauren and uh, Lauren. How are you this morning? Very good, thank you. I'm armed with uh, coffee and ready to go. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's start with maybe a little bit about your story. We met uh, mm -hmm. at the uh, 15 Seconds Festival in Graz, which was absolutely amazing. Let's give the guys a shout out, putting together a hybrid festival, but then again, 3,000 people in person. And uh, Lauren and I were speakers at the event and had a chance to, to have a dinner, to crack a lot of jokes. And um, yeah, it's been just uh, fantastic. Also, listening to your keynote, which was absolutely inspiring. And uh, But I, but I, wanna, I want for the audience to, to get a sense about who you are, to maybe share a little bit about your story. Uh, you are living in the UK, as I understand, but you are not from there. So could you maybe give us a context about who is Lauren? Who is Lauren? I mean, how long do you have? <laughs> uh, where to start? So currently where I am, I'll start there and I'll, I'll explain maybe how I got there. Um, so I'm Exec Creative Director at PwC UK. Uh, what on earth does that mean? Uh, so I joined actually a couple of years ago to co-found a new design capability. Um, and it's called Experience Consulting. So it's essentially... I like describing it as a problem solving capability. We use inside the heart to really design interventions, sometimes big ones like new companies like Starling Bank, for instance, and sometimes smaller ones such as like, you know, fixing journeys or helping doctors and patients in healthcare. Um, but I mean, I'm surprised where I am, if I'm perfectly honest. You know, I started my life in Australia as a designer. I did, um, you know, a media and arts degree. I went to agency land. I love art direction. And then I realized I just love designing and I love designing to solve problems. And all through my career, I've spent in creative and digital agencies here in the UK. And the more I went into it, I had identity crises because I was like, oh, I like designing digital stuff. And then I was like, oh no, I like designing coffee table books. And I was like, oh no, I like doing like interactive film stuff. And I'm like, what am I, you know? And I realized that the problem solving aspect was the thing that I loved. And so now I have a chance to do that on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Um, but yeah, it's been a crazy journey. I've been here 13 years, maybe 14 years, something like that, um, and love it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a wild journey to say the least. How was it for you to come from Australia and to get used to the British environment? Oh, wow. I mean, I landed in November in the UK, which it was rainy and cold. And I just come out of 30 degree heat. And I remember thinking I was by myself. So I was actually transferred as a young designer from the agency I was working in Sydney to the branch here in, in the UK. And I moved in three weeks, I think. So I found someone to move into my flat, you know, I sold my car, <laughs> like it was crazy. So then I landed here by myself. And looking back on that, I don't even know what I was thinking. Um, but it was so different. It was dark until like, yeah, eight or nine in the morning, it was dark again at four o'clock. I was like, where is the sun? Like, where's... So yeah, it took a little while. And uh, it took a little bit of time, I think, to acclimatize culturally because people think that the UK and Australia is quite similar, but it's really not, not in my sort of understanding. The way that you engage with people, the way that you behave, the way that you act, it's quite different. And it takes a while to pick up, I suppose, on that nuance and, and figure it out. But the design industry here is just amazing. Um, so it's a very addictive place to stay if you're a designer. <laughs> and maybe for the people from the audience who are not so much aware about this kind of industry you're an executive creative director but what does it mean to be oh, an gosh. executive creative director good question uh so i come from a visual design background you know i trained as i said as a visual designer um my responsibility has 
always been ultimately how do you take the essence of what a brand stands for so their purpose their vision their mission their values uh, their tone of voice their personality how do you take those elements and how do you execute them in different channels so whether it happens to be in digital or print or you know telephony or face to face for instance retail environments and how do you choose the right the right colors the right feeling the right textures the right type the right imagery and art direction of that photography or film or and how do you assemble those elements in the way that echoes against that brand and when it's done right you probably don't even notice in some ways because it feels like it should you know when you work with someone like a or engage rather with someone like a nike you know it's like, yeah, of course that's Nike. But the work that goes into crafting it to make sure that it does deliver on that is, is quite a lot behind the scenes. And so what I do now has an element of that. So I work in creating entirely new brands. So for instance, when we work with like challenger banks or setting up sort of new organizations, we'll create that brand from scratch. So that includes all that strategy element and then it includes the execution of it, which I, I mean, I love that side of it as well. <laughs> it's the fun bit for me. Um, or it means that sometimes you work with organizations who have a brand, but maybe it's not landing in the same way as it used to. There's a, a lot that's happened over the last 18 months to do with the pandemic and the, you know, really the hyper acceleration of people going towards digital. So I work with organizations now who have been mainly physical and face to face. And they're like, how do we translate that feeling, that sort of high touch, maybe luxury feeling into digital? And so again, it's taking what the brand stands for and figuring out how do we execute it in a way that is going to be engaging and emotionally driven and multisensory and all of that fun stuff. Um, and so that's what, yeah, I do today. I, I work with organizations. I understand strategically what their challenges are and then collaborate with an amazing group of people to say, okay, well, that end interaction needs to change in a particular way. And what does that look and feel like? And then make it, obviously, which is also a fun part. I, I've, I can fully relate to your obsession to solve problems creatively. Um, mm -hmm. Myself, my background is from video and movie production. I have a little agency, used to have an agency in Denmark. And I thought it's about the the filmmaking or the storytelling. You know, mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of stuff with video, but at the end of the day, it was actually about how do we solve a problem for a client by using the means of video, of design, of all these other things. So I can fully understand where you come from. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, also, because today I want to talk to you about the effective leadership of creative teams, but could you maybe give us a bit of a context? What are the kind of people that you're leading? What, what, what are the type of roles of the creatives under your management? So we have, I suppose, a slightly different set of individuals based on, on where we are and how we operate. Um, the entire team, just to give people a bit of context, involve individuals from an insight perspective, so uh, quantum qual researchers. Then we have people that are very much what we term as like experienced strategists, and they're the ones that are responsible really for bringing in all of that insight and championing the, the needs and behaviors of individuals and working on things like value prop design and essentially the product for um, the product strategy or a service strategy. Then we have, um, going more into, I suppose, the design end of the spectrum, we have experienced designers. So ranging from traditional maybe UX designers through to we have an architect on the team for spatial requirements. So experience is slightly more general, I suppose, for us and mainly due to the fact we work with loads of industries and contexts. <laughs> um, and then we have sort of more traditional, I suppose, visual design. But... Within the team, we have people that are more brand focused. So brand designers, we have people that are a little bit more product focused. We have people that are really like speculative design focused. Um, I mean, it's all we have a cinematographer and videographer. We have a really wide range, I suppose, of individuals. So when it comes down to what are the type of individuals I lead, I mean, they're an entire diverse mixed bag of background and experience and you know some are from agencies some are from consultancies in-house architecture studios you know all over the shop um i think 
it takes a certain type of creative potentially working in what we do with the type of individuals I look for. I need people that are comfortable with ambiguity, you know, that really are fine not knowing the answer and want to strive to find that answer. Um, you need to enjoy that process because we don't get briefs. You know, we're talking with clients and they're like, you know what, I'm just not landing with my customers anymore. Or I'm thinking about, you know, redesigning a hospital. What do I do? I mean, you're like, <laughs> it starts very much from a blank sheet of paper and you need to go on that journey. I'm just curious, is that uh, you're not using briefs? Is that uh, the kind of the transformation of the industry? It is not efficient anymore to create briefs or is that just like an internal strategy of yours? I think the main thing for us is that we don't have a clarified understanding of like the problem statement when we first have a conversation, you know, so essentially we do not have the elements that would even form a brief in the traditional sense. And so part of what we need to do is to actually absorb and listen to that. And then we need to be able to, like I referenced before, we have amazing group of insight professionals. We need to be able to essentially uncover what the problem is. So you're already involved in the challenge and the project as you're defining the problem, if you see what I mean. And so you're already working in a mixed discipline team. You're already all involved from day one. Therefore, there's no need for a brief at that stage. If we were to write a brief, we would need all of those elements and it would be a lot further on actually within the project stage where you'd be able to go, oh, okay, so this is what we know about the end user. These are the channels. This is the key message. You know, we just don't get there, I suppose, until a lot later. Does that make sense? It does. I, I think it's uh, probably the right approach in any case, because you, at the beginning, you wouldn't be able to to go deep into understanding what the problem is. So you yeah. need to go through some processes and uh, analysis and observation and, and so on and so forth to be able to get into the core of what are we actually trying to solve? Um, yeah. and, and I'm curious, as you as a leader, what percentage of your time goes into execution, getting things done, as opposed to prioritizing, leading my team, being there for my team, providing feedback? Where do you stand? I think that's a really good question. Percentage-wise, I'm not entirely sure. I, I wear a multiple hats, I suppose, which is slightly unusual. Um, so I have a hat that's more like co-founder of what we do. So that involves a lot around strategy and planning and who knew there'd be so many like spreadsheets in my life as a designer, but apparently there are. Um, then I have my sort of ECD, exec creative director hat. So to your point, that hat involves being a discipline lead and being able to look at the work that we're doing. And there's also the pitching aspects of growing the business, um, which is slightly different than obviously delivering the work because again at those points the challenges are quite obtuse and it takes a little bit longer to figure it out different teams and then to exactly what you're saying I'm, I'm relationship lead for our entire unit so I look after career progression and you know personal development and so on and then I have my team as well you know so I I'm always constantly having to balance between all of them and I think the easiest way for me to do that is I generally am incredibly honest with my team around what I might need to focus on and at what time. And I explain why. Um, and so sometimes I will have a bit more time where I'm in the execution end of the spectrum. And other times I have design crits blocked out that I protect, you know, <laughs> I'm like no more meetings in design crit times. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that is just your dedicated time. However you guys want to use it. You know, we can just chat about different topics or we can go through different projects. So it's tough, basically. You can probably tell um, getting it right. It is really tough. Great. It is really tough. Yeah. I think I think there's other industries that probably have a better chance to prioritize and their schedule isn't changing so much as opposed to the this kind of industry. There's, there's so much stuff happening that you couldn't predict that you should be able yeah. to react on very quickly give feedback something breaks you gotta go there project is you know there's so many things and that's why i'm also very curious because there's many entrepreneurs and founders listening to this podcast 
and it's a little different, but but in many in many ways they're also wearing so many hats. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any specific practical strategies on a weekly, on a daily basis that help you to to be on the top of your game, to to be on top of things. Mm. Coffee? <laughs> no. Um, good question. I think for me, and everyone's going to be completely different. Uh, I think for me, it's very hard to be productive without prioritization. And you need to be able to prioritize the use of your time against your own qualification criteria. And that's probably going to be different for absolutely everyone. Um, and everyone needs to decide what that criteria is, whether it happens to be you know, their own career, whether it's potentially yeah, their business, if you're talking about founders, whether it happens to be something totally different. Because I think otherwise, I'm sure everyone else has experienced this, you get pulled in so many different directions and you've got, you know, priority one, 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 one that you need to deal with. And you need some way of filtering that and saying, actually, I might need to just put a pause in this particular piece because I need to tackle this. And the reason I'm choosing it is against this qualifica qualification criteria. I think though, as part of that, we have here as a culture at PwC quite a measurable goals approach. So one of the things when I first joined, which I found quite surprising, was our goals had to be incredibly measurable. And I come out the back of 20 years in creative and digital agencies where I'm sure, again, I'm just talking for myself here. I'm sure it's not everywhere. But the goals were much looser. You know, it was literally... I want to create great work, but I didn't really state what that was, what it did, what impact it might have. You know, you were just there to create. Whereas I came into a, a culture which was like, OK, so this is what you want to focus on. How are you going to know that you've succeeded? Is it going to be based on projects that you've won or pitches, for instance, that you've won, things you've engaged, feedback that you receive from the team? Like, what is all of these metrics? And so that definitely helps filter because you need to remain constantly self-aware of whether you're on track or not um because if you're not and i i definitely spin off track every now and again i get distracted and i'm like oh there's all these stuff, like amazing stuff over here i want to do that that's normal but you need to kind of go hang on a second i need to come back and because of that it's easier to be honest with other people and I think, you know, being really clear on your um, priorities with other people and don't just, so I share my goals with my team, for instance, you know, I'm completely open and honest around what my goals are. Um, I share them with all of my peers that I, in the leadership group, and that also helps dramatically. I think sometimes people hold on to what they're really trying to focus and it makes it harder to be clearer around why you can't join a meeting or why you can't support an engagement because you're on, you know, 20 other things. You know, it just makes that a little bit more difficult. Do you see what it's I very, mean? It's very interesting yeah. that you're sharing this. I I recently did a workshop with a large organization and I asked this question to a very productive team, I would say, and asked them the question, could you write down what are your personally in, in the job, in the workplace, your top three priorities at the moment. And they had to reflect on that. And then I asked them, do you know what are the priorities, top three priorities? Can you guess what are the top three priorities of the other people from the team? Mm. A, a, and that was the question. They were like, mm, I'm kind of clear what I'm after, but I don't know what my manager's priorities are. Oh, interesting. And it sounds so simple. But because it's so simple, sometimes we forget to have this consistent communication, frequent communication mm -hmm. on a on a daily, on a weekly, depending on the kind of work. I always recommend people to, if you're working closely with a team, to to have these daily stand-ups, even if it's virtual, mm -hmm. even if it's 10, 15 yeah. minutes, but just to really align on because priorities are changing sometimes. The big, the big vision, you know, the quarterly, the the the, the yearly priorities might be. Not changing so much, but but the weekly, the daily, how do we mm, the tactics or the strategies to unlock those things That's will right. change? Yeah. That's and, super interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, so many organizations that I've been in touch with and, and, and because we're so busy, right? In doing, 
stuff. Um, and that's part of question. You you said that, uh, and I can imagine it's it's the case with PwC. There's more structure. There's more goals and objectives. But still, you're working with creative people, and creative creative people don't have the you know they're not famous for for being always delivering on deadline and being super focused so, so how do you deal with that how do we help uh, creative people to respect deadlines and to to be more focused goodness that's an interesting question i think to give you a sense around some of the goals i was talking about before because my team obviously have the you know their own goals the things that when i talk to them i'm like in a year or a period of time, what is going to make you feel happy? What are you going to look around and see where you feel that you're successful? You know, and so some of the goals that the team have are like, you know, I want to be a brand leader. You're like, okay, that's great. That's all the goal needs to be. Underpinning that, you're going to need some strategies and tactics, like we were just mentioning, the things that would change on a regular basis. But the goal is quite emotionally driven um which i find keeps people very much on track so you know it has to resonate really with themselves it can't be this thing that they think other people other people have this goal and therefore i should have the same one you know you kind of waft off and you know you're not attached to it um and so there's a there's a central goal around something that people want to do so they're true passion topics there's something around the, you know being this brand leader, so that's something that would affect positively themselves as well as the business unit and kind of help us grow. And then there's always a goal above and beyond that, which I ask people to write, which is around purpose and society or something much more broad. So they feel more, um, well, essentially purpose-led in what they're trying to achieve. And it's like this little onion of you know, stuff. That I find keeps everyone more focused in general. Um, people are more attached to it. People are like, okay, if I want to be a brand leader, what do I need to do? It's like, well, people need to know that I am a brand leader. Well, hang on a second. How do I get people to know that? Well, I need to maybe think about stepping up a bit more in certain engagements or I, or I need to be able to choose the right things to work on or I need to talk potentially at some of our team meetings about brand or I need to run like a lunch and learn, you know, and people just like spin off into like these amazing little like entrepreneurial type activities that are all like self-driven you know i i very rarely like obviously meet up with my team but i re rarely have to say well have you done anything you know around this they're more coming to me going what about if i do this what about if i do that um and so culturally we run a very outcome driven environment um you know, hours are up to individuals, for instance, obviously, if you're in a team, you need to come into daily stand ups and retros and all of that, you know, but if you finish your work in four days and not five, um, you can use your fifth day for whatever you would like. Um, people tend to then do it based on something like what I said, their goal around being a brand leader, they'll base it around something like that, or they'll donate their time or volunteer or, you know, things along those lines. Um, so I don't have the same challenge of people missing deadlines. I think I think when people are not emotionally attached to what they're doing and they don't see themselves in the work, they're not vested in the result, it's easy for them to take a back seat and like, oh, that person's driving that train. Fine. Well, I'll just be a passenger and yeah, maybe I'll turn up or maybe I won't, you know, um, sorry, conceptually in this awful analogy. <laughs> maybe I'll get off at that station. Maybe I won't. Um, but, you know, when they are vested in it, it just changes the entire ball game. They're more empowered and more driven. I love the fact that you take the time to to have these conversations with people mm -hmm. and it might sound natural for you and you might take it for granted, but it's not, it's not everywhere that leaders are taking the time to really understand what drives the people they're managing, what is driving them, where do they want to be, sometimes helping them to clarify it because they might not be clear mm. and allowing them to have as many tasks throw in their direction that are going to help them to to get into where they want to go uh very conscious kind of leadership and, and i'm curious if you have any other now that we are reflecting again <laughs> kind of <laughs> ideas on how do we onboard people like somebody new comes on board how do we make sure that they're feeling at home as leaders mm -hmm. what, 
what can we do to to be more conscious and to make them feel at home? Mm, I think that's a really good question. I don't think we have it entirely perfect ourselves yet. So we're actually redesigning our onboarding process as we speak. Um, I think somewhere in another tab, I have like onboarding comms open. I need to read today, so it's very the much designer, on my mind. Yeah, the designer, <laughs> it's like <laughs> like must design this. Well, it was funny actually because we so because we're um, we're a team in PwC, but as you can probably imagine, all of the teams have a certain flavor. There's a, a wonderful sustainability team, for instance, that has a slightly different flavor than some of the teams, for instance, within FS or you know. So there's a lot of different internal perspectives and so on um, but we're all part of pwc so there's like a core onboarding process that where there's like inductions and meetings and all of that and you get to really know what pwc stands for and, and all those elements but we then have an onboarding process into our team as well so it's kind of a a 50 50 split and i imagine it's the same for lots of other teams um and so this piece for us has always with been so busy frankly it's always been one of those things where we care a lot and we have buddies and you know make sure we welcome everyone but we a couple of months ago we looked at the process and we were like why are we not applying our own way of working as experienced designers <laughs> to our onboarding <laughs> it just it seemed kind of crazy right um so at the moment um we're in this process of yeah redesigning uh the comms supporting people between the time they get you know contract to join we've got buddy systems obviously um and then we're also producing a wiki um we started off by designing fancier materials um for onboarding and then realized midway through we just need a wiki like we are constantly evolving and changing and there's different tools and programs and processes and we had these lovely beautifully designed documents and yet obviously people join the team would still be asking these questions around oh if i want to do training where am i going and i was like oh we can't keep updating it so now we literally have like an entire wiki and the team just feed into it so anything new goes straight into the the wiki basically so we've got like a a central font of knowledge hopefully <laughs> <laughs> that is the intention. Um, but so from my perspective, there's all that stuff happening. But for me, um, I protect the first couple of weeks of time for all of the new starters. So no projects, nothing billable. Um, we have compliance. You do not want to know some of the things. Um, so we have to go through that process. So the easier and calmer that people have the initial couple of weeks, they get settled in. I then tend to give them projects which aren't client facing and not billable. So volunteer work, for instance, and we have just done some work and continue to do actually with an organization around autism and ADHD. And we're looking at you know redesigning their brand and their website. Um, and so some of the new designers that just joined the team recently kind of went on to that because it was like a, a nice purpose-led piece where you weren't delivering you know every week in sprints. It was a bit more relaxed. And then they get used to the way that we work, the way that we talk. It's kind of a softer entry, basically, into something. Um, but it is tough sometimes protecting those initial couple of weeks because, you know, you're a business and you've got different things on. But it's crucially important, I think, to allow people to settle. To some extent, it's also kind of nice when you get into a new organization to, to be put into action immediately. So that's mm -hmm. that's part of the whole, yeah. even though it doesn't look perfect on paper, it might be doing a really good favor for the new person. Yeah. Of course, yeah, we, we need to approach with care when they're having enough time to be given feedback, to be introduced and everything. But uh, yeah, we're very different because we have a, because I completely agree, but we don't have a structure. So I think it would be if someone happens to be working, for instance, in-house and there's a construct around them, they could probably slot in and then they get to know everyone. And to your point, there's a certain level of comfort and confidence that you would build being in that process. Um, we have a really loose governance structure here. So every project is run by the project team and they decide the cadence, they decide the construct, they decide the deliverables, like they own that project and relationship. Uh, and if you think about all the industries that we work with, there's very few projects running at the moment that run at the same speed with the same team size, the same construct, the same deliverables. So it's hard for new people to um, kind of come into a process which feels 
I suppose, supportive and calming by joining something because they'd be joining something with three other people that's running it however, whatever period of time. They don't have the quantity, I suppose, of that framework. I see. And as I understand, you're also uh, to some level responsible for, for the culture in your team. Um, if you can describe the culture with only three words, what would these three words be? Hmm. Uh, only three words. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm going to, I have to break, I have to break your three word thing because there's a few principles that we have and I can't seem to summarize them down into three <laughs> words. But, um, so we actually got together recently as a team uh, and we were talking about this. One of them is we believe in better, you know, so it's not always the fact it has to be perfect. Sometimes you're going to come up against things you can't change. But for us, it's being, it literally is that belief in knowing there is a better solution. There's a better way of doing something and that motivation that you get to drive you to that point. Um, I think that's super crucial for us. We're very close knit as a team. Uh, we're very honest and transparent and open with everything that works and everything that doesn't work. So there is a, I suppose, a, a preset culture at PwC around feedback, which is really interesting. So all through the year, you get constant feedback on everything that you do and, and you're working with people all around. Uh, and I think that was already set up, but what we tried to do and what I specifically also tried to do was that there's very little difference um, where it's like, oh, there's work at work and life, you know, you, you just keep it private. Everything that happens at home affects how you work ultimately, you know, so um, I had someone recently in the team that had to suddenly move house and couldn't find somewhere to move to and, you know, all of these factors are happening. And I think we just spoke about that. And then I shifted around his schedule to make sure that he felt supportive and he wasn't kind of coming into something totally crazy when I knew that he was like moving out at two o'clock in the morning. You know, so I think being very open and honest and being quite, I guess that generates a quite nice closeness in the team definitely helps. And that's, um, that's a tough one. That one yeah. is a tough one for the leaders to create a safe and trusted environment for people to be open. Because sometimes yeah. leaders... It's easier for a leader to be open sometimes, but how do we make it uh, so that people, when they make a mistake, when something is not okay, they're feeling okay to come and tell their manager? Yeah, That's, and it's uh, really hard. Like sometimes, you know, with the feedback, I've had feedback directly from like some of the team members, which actually reflecting on it, they were they were right. You know, <laughs> there was like I got ironic because we're talking about a productivity piece but um I got a piece of feedback about 18 months ago saying you know I stretch myself too thin on too many different things and you know this is from one of my junior team members saying you know it would be really good if I could have a bit more focus and they were right you know and they're still right even to this day I keep myself accountable to this person and I'm like <laughs> I say I'm like I've decided not to do this thing because I'm listening to your advice, you know, and I think you have to be willing to be as vulnerable as everyone else. And I've had to be quite honest about certain things that are happening, you know, for myself or how I'm feeling. If you lock down and you don't do that, then it's really hard to get it reciprocated. Uh, but it's not easy by any means. No, I can I can understand it. It's not, an, and I thank you for sharing this example because. Uh, Sometimes we, we're very good in leading, managing other people to be focused and to be on track, but then we kind of get off track and forget to leave space for us to, to really focus and prioritize and, and be keepers of our own time and the, the, the main priorities. Um, and when you started speaking about that, this a concept that... Uh, that I heard about from, um, I don't know if you met Steli Efti. He's, uh, he's been a speaker at 15 seconds, but actually he didn't come this year. Uh, he's the CEO of a company called Close.com. They, they do like a CRM system. Uh, and um, I listened to one of his podcasts and he, he spoke about 
the concept of managing up and creating a culture where your people manage you up. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I listened to it and, and it was it made so much sense to me. And I'm super happy. And I every time I have a new person on the team, I send them the podcast episode because I really want them to feel empowered to manage me. Mm -hmm. I'm not their boss. I'm there to provide and to take care of everybody and to, to lead and to take certain decisions. But but I want them to manage me. If if there is an email that I didn't send them because I have so many other things to do, I want them to say, hey, Storm, you said you're going to send me the email. Where is it? I need to move. I want yeah. that from them. And and this culture of managing up is, is sometimes really difficult to create for the same kind of reason that people are afraid to, to bother their manager. Mm -hmm. They're probably so busy. Why should I ask them? I'm going to wait. Yeah, but your manager is probably having 15 more things to think about and decisions to take. So uh, in reality, it is so good when you have people who can manage you up. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. hear your perspective on that as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it makes a world of difference. I I didn't really have a lot of upward feedback, you know, over in Craven Digital Agencies and so on. It, it was very hard to have that particular culture. And I think it was just a way of working that set there that, you know, you just didn't generally do that. With PwC, because of the feedback construct, you have to, it's a requirement, you know, to get feedback from everyone. So it's the people that you lead, it's the people that you work with at peer level, it's, you know, the people that you report to, it's clients, it's everyone. So it's like this full, full piece. And I think the first year I did it, I felt so emotionally vulnerable because I was just getting like, and thankfully it was quite positive, but I was getting these, these opinions like left, right and center around who I was and how people perceived me and what they loved and, and bits and pieces. I was just like, whoa, this is intense. You know, I felt like it was a wave of stuff. Um, but since then, you know, you change how you absorb the feedback. Like the example that I gave, that individual was right. And I've taken that on and I can be better. And there's other instances like that as well, where you just have to encourage people to let you know, because you get caught in your own bubble of what you're doing. And everyone has weaknesses. I get a little bit distracted. I love doing stuff and making things. And I'm like, I like helping people. And like you just kind of like, oh, yeah, we could do that. Oh, what about that? Oh, let's create that. And, you know, you're like, whoa, hang on a second. Actually, let's take a moment. Let's be... Let's take a step back and figure out, going back to my earlier point, what's my prioritization criteria, <laughs> you know? Um, and so you need to be kept a bit honest along the way. And sometimes, um, I'll give you another example. Um, I got a bit of feedback around the fact I was protecting some of the team members too much. So from my perspective in that situation, I was trying to do something good. I was or I thought was good, right? So I had the best of intentions. I'd thought it through. Um, it wasn't like I just did it, you know, off the cuff. But the person involved was like, actually, like, you're protecting too much. I want to go out and do X, Y, and Z, and I want to make the mistakes and all of that. And I was like, okay, that's really good to hear because it came from a good place, but it wasn't the right thing for that person. And so took a moment and I stopped doing that and yeah, they flourished. So it's stuff like that. You don't even do things knowing it's not right. You do them because you think you're making the right decision, but it's not always the case, is it? So it's good to get pulled up on that. I thank you, Lauren, for being so honest and like you're talking about one of your values is uh, honesty and transparency. And I can see how you're living it even during this podcast. <laughs> thank you so much for 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 sharing. Because I think as leaders, we also need to to leave our ego aside and and, and admit that mm -hmm. we cannot be right all the time. We're actually making a lot of mistakes. Often, if it's coming from it's coming from a good place, we have a good intention. But yeah, hey, we're human. Exactly, exactly. And there's there's only those ways that you're going to learn. And there's obvious things I think I've learned along my career around leadership. And they're the real key things. You listen to podcasts like this one. Uh, you know, you read books, you do stuff like that. But it's sometimes only when you go through certain circumstances and you're like, 
oh, no one told me about that. Okay, I got a second. <laughs> Need to remember to do that in future. And they're the weird and little nuanced bits, right? That you you just need to learn by practice and, and life experience. And in that perspective, could you also maybe share what would be your advice to up and coming people who wants to make it in the creative industry, maybe they're in the early 20s, finishing university. Now that you've gone quite farther in your journey, what would be some pieces of advice in terms of how, what should they do? do better or should, should they focus more of looking backwards to maybe when you were at that age yourself and mm -hmm. uh, now if you can give advice to your 20 years old self, what would that be? Maybe uh, don't go out until 2 a.m. in the morning and then go to work. <laughs> no, uh, I find that question a little bit tricky only because there are so many flavors of creative Uh, so even in my career, I definitely tried lots of, lots of things and I enjoyed all of them, but it really depends where your heart is for what you want to do. I think one bit of advice, I suppose, I had a bit of an identity crisis when I was younger because I assumed I had to have a label. So I had to be a digital designer or I had to be a print designer. And I felt like if I didn't have a label and an expectation of what I was I literally was like who am I what do I focus on like, <laughs> um, and I think for me off the back of that that's where I realized the problem solving element and it was a real breakthrough for me um, and that you don't actually need to have a discipline label you just need to figure out what really drives you and when I found that bit it made a lot of the other decision making a lot easier and the things that I worked on or didn't work on was a lot easier um, I think more broadly though I would say if I could go back in time I defined my values so much later in life and I really wish I'd taken the time to do it earlier And even when I was first, you know, kind of sort of like seven years ago, eight years ago, something like that, where I, you know, sat down and did my values um, with some other individuals. And at the time I rolled my eyes. I was like, like what's going on? This is ridiculous. Like, why are we having to do this exercise? Um, and now I realize, you know, having identified them then, why, why did it take me so long? Like, it really helped me understand why I loved certain things, they help me understand why sometimes an individual that you work with, you might really like, but just they rub you the wrong way sometimes, you know, and you realize, or you work somewhere actually, and then it just doesn't quite fit. And you're not sure why you might be like, hey, the work's great. And the people I'm working with, I really enjoy, but something's not the right fit for me. It's often because that organization or those individuals go against your particular values. And therefore, you're just having a bit of a like you know friction. Ultimately, I would recommend everyone to do their values, no matter what they do from a creative perspective. And maybe to build on top of that, uh, probably some of the most meaningful things that I did in my 20s is attending personal development seminars and, and trainings. Mm -hmm. And just like you. Uh, My mom actually signed me up for the first time uh, one kind of a course because I had uh, I had an injury with my leg and there was it sounds crazy but there was this seminar that they were marketing it that it has some self healing kind of uh, features oh, the okay. seminar and my mom like I wanted to play football and I love to play football but I had an injury in my in, in my feet and I couldn't heal for for a while and so so she signed me up for for this uh, seminar but it was actually 10 days it was four hours a day and you were supposed to to stay in a power pose and smile for four hours wow literally like, like hands on <laughs> not just that of course they, they, they do lectures meditations you write yeah. your goals so it was very holistic but one of the rules was you're not allowed not to smile so we had to wow. stay just like like this for four hours and I've never been so positive in my life first of all but 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 it was also for me a huge eye-opener in terms of wow there is a different world out there when you when you start looking inside mm. when you start 
figuring out what's my values, what's my passions, uh, what are the things that I want to improve, what are some of the habits and beliefs which I picked on the way, but they're not necessarily mine. Mm -hmm. Can I uncover, like people say, I want to find myself. In a way, it's, you uncover yourself because there's a lot of layers. You've always been there. Mm. You know, it's just yeah. you're getting closer to who you are. That doesn't mean you got to find it somewhere else. No, no, it's here already. Yeah. I think um, values as well, I'm sure, are set. I seem to remember reading, so don't quote me on this. But some points when you're like 11, between 11 and 13, your core values are actually set. And then from there, they obviously are exhibited in different ways, depending on your maturity level. And, and as you grow up, they, they do manifest in different ways. But, you know, the, the three for me, um, I have one around shared ambition because I realized that in my life, when I'm surrounded by individuals, it's not the fact it needs to be my ambition, it's the fact that all of us are contributing to a shared one, makes me happy. Like, I just feel like I'm just generally in flow and and have, there've been some of the best times in my life, you know, some of the most roller coaster times in my life, you know, with little startups and so on, but, but knowing that you're with other people kind of charging forward, and I suppose that makes sense why I'm also co-founding this this design capability it's a very similar thing right um and then the others are actually quite interesting but the other is um, making a difference but as much as I would like to say it's altruistically led which is great if you can help it literally is being able to see even the smallest impact from what you do so knowing that you just adjusted how someone works on a day-to-day -day basis or, you know, how someone engages with the world and you just have that satisfaction come back from your efforts. You know, it's kind of, for me, closes the loop for the, the hard work and seeing that as a result. Um, and the last is, hopefully no one takes this the wrong way, but the last is excellence. Um, it's not about being perfect by any means, but it drives me absolutely bananas when people don't try. So, if you just strive for your best, wherever that lands, great, you know, and you can make mistakes and, you know, that's all part of it. But the whole point is just trying to do the very best that you can. Huge difference. It really does drive me nuts when people don't try. And since you mentioned the uh, perfection, many creative people struggle with trying to be perfect. That's the, the opposite. Yeah. So, so what did you... What did you share for, for? I mean, I don't know. Did you? Did you? Have you been struggling with that yourself? And and what would be your advice for maybe leaders who work with people who have perfectionistic tendencies? Mm, interesting. So yeah, when I was younger, um, if there's anyone watching this that knows me, it's going to be interesting because when I was younger, I very much would work huge hours just trying to make things absolutely perfect you know I was like I have to get it right and you know I, I'm a very grid based designer and I had to get my like one pixel grids working anyway that's probably a conversation for another time um but I realized that pretty much what everyone else knows but the last sort of five and ten percent of what you're doing that takes the longest the investment emotionally and psychologically and sometimes financially from a team perspective, just to get it to that like one little puppy point, doesn't make sense. You could have moved on to something else and had, you know, an amazing element of impact. You know? and, and I think things like user testing have helped me. Um, being able to iterate helped me. Being agile helps. You know, when you had those, when I was younger, when you had those big waterfall-like structures of, you know, 10 months working on a web build, and you would be really trying to make sure that at launch it was like perfect. Now, you know, we run and deliver work on a weekly basis and test and learn loops, you know, all of that sort of jazz. And that's broken in a good way. The need to reach like this perfect level of perfection, it helps you do the best that you can, test it, then make it even better, test it, make it even better. And so you invest your time in the right ways. I think when work is hidden behind a golden curtain for too long and then revealed at the end, it's so easy to fall down, you know, the spiral around. Is that ligature on the type, you know, absolutely perfect or not? It's like, no. Yeah. So more testing, more testing with users, I guess, would be the best way to break a 
someone that struggles with perfection. You know, my my co-author Cristobal Alonso, he's a CEO of uh, the largest B two B startup accelerator, startup wise guys uh, in Europe, and he has this mantra in a way: I would rather take. 10 decisions, three of them being wrong, as mm-hmm. opposed to trying to take three perfect decisions. Yeah. yeah. For, for the same kind of reason, because even if something is wrong, but then you get feedback, you very quickly can adapt and see, because otherwise it's in your head. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's, you're making something perfect as opposed to your own understandings, not having yeah. other people, the market, the client to to judge what what is a you know the quality so yeah, very much it's, a, it's a very good kind of a point and and just coming back to the other point that you make um what would be your advice in terms of you know you mentioned don't get attached to a title for example but would you say go try different things or would you recommend people to to focus on this one thing that they become exceptionally good at what, hmm. do you, what would you advise the, again, this kind of a group of people mm-hmm. just maybe fresh out of college? Hmm. I would say fresh out of college, try as many things as possible. Um, by that, though, I think it's still in your style. So what I mean is sort of, you know, don't scatter shot in different areas on different topics in different styles and different everything and different ways of designing because it will be too much. <laughs> Your brain will be like, where am I and what's going on? I think there's important to get a sense of variety and to look into other mediums, but to find your true style underneath. Um, and by that, I mean, if you happen to be um, a very minimal designer, for instance, you know, your passion might be only in black and white. I'm just trying to say something quite extreme. Then it's looking at how do you apply that within digital or how might you actually bring it to life in print? Would you actually apply it spatially, you know, somewhere? Because it makes you think differently. It makes you think in different sort of dimensions. It makes you think in different materials, textures. It makes you understand how people will engage with it, you know, whether it's, literally like something on your phone or whether it's something that you actually walk into as a space requires you to to think in different ways and when you're younger I think that really helps you to to generally broaden your horizons better and and potentially find what you truly love a little bit faster um having said that I'm sure there's people out there that would just start as a product designer and just go on as a product designer it's (laughs) It, it, it also comes down, else are different from each other right we're all very comes down to the to the self-awareness like digging into who you are like are you a person who wants to be around many different places and try things out or, or do you as you said maybe try different things but then find your thing and just stay there if that's who you are like looking at you for example i couldn't imagine you doing just one thing <laughs> i don't know i might be wrong but but the, but you found your spot by trying and, and, and doing different things. There's a very interesting book, by the way, called, uh, I think it's called Range. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm going to double check the name <laughs> to make sure it's the right one. Email but, email. <laughs> but I think that the main, the main idea is that when we try out different things, we get very enriched and we actually can perform really well in the one thing we decide to be, to develop into. Uh, and they, it's like a 10 hour audio book. So it's like a lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of case studies and stories and so on, which is very, very interesting. We're going to post it in the comments uh, on the episode. And uh, Lauren, since the time is going, uh, is going up, is ticking away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to ask you just a final question. Do you have any personal productivity habits? Be it, I know about your coffee. No. <laughs> Still going, yeah. <laughs> like, what do you do personally? Do you exercise? Do you meditate? Do you journal? Like, do you have any specific practices you do to stay to stay sharp? Good question. I'm not very good. Uh, going back to the honesty thing, I'm not very good meditating or taking time out. Or like, I, I do feel like there's a part of me which feels like I should say that's how I'm productive because I think it works for some people. Um, but for me, for me, it's understanding why I'm doing something 
it's understanding the impact that thing is going to have and how it's going to essentially reflect back on what I'm trying to achieve. I tend to multitask a lot. I promise I'm not typing or anything right now. <laughs> um, but I think I enjoy that side of it. You know, I enjoy thinking about lots of different topics and I enjoy solving lots of things. I think I'm just built in that particular way. So I'm not very good to sit back and relax and meditate. I'm more likely to put on techno and have a coffee and, you know, crack on. <laughs> the only thing I would say for me personally is um, I like to disrupt my time and break it up with things that give me meaning. So I think that there is a part of me which has a goal around, you know, what I want to achieve, how I want to grow the team, you know, all of those sort of elements. And then there's a part of me where I love like mentoring young designers. Um, I like supporting initiatives like the autism and ADHD organization. I love the fact we're doing that work. And so I think it's important to break for me, break my time up with clients doing things that give me a feeling, feeling good, like feeling like I'm giving back, knowing that those elements are a chance for me to support other people potentially or spark new thinking or, like yesterday morning, I had, you do not want to know, actually, I just looked at my calendar, how many meetings I had yesterday morning, but I also had three 20 minute mentoring sessions with, you know, designers. And that feels great. Like, so it was a crazy morning, but at the same time, I was like, actually, I did this piece. This is how I'm progressing on my goals. This is how I'm progressing personally. And I had a chance to actually help out some other people. Um, and that gives me a sense of balance and keeps me kind of churning along. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren, for sharing. And, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in and making it to the end of the episode. <laughs> if you enjoyed this one as much as I did, there's 81 more episodes, and you can find it on any major podcast platform, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, you name it, Productivity Mastery. Subscribe, review, give us a rating, share with a friend. We'll be really happy so we can keep on bringing you amazing people like Lauren. Lauren, where could people find you? And if somebody is interested to maybe try and get an internship or a job, where could they get in touch with you? And of course, if you have any final message to all the creative people listening. Well, anyone feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I'm the only Lauren Plato Pierce. That name is like quite long. So you can definitely find me on LinkedIn and uh, pop me a message. I'm more than happy to have a chat. I think um, I'm on Twitter a bit, but to be honest, not anywhere near as much as Instagram and things like that. Um, advice for creative people is like, don't stress out. I like, don't think that you have to be high performing and high functioning and everything all the time. You know, it's impossible. Um, and I think the standards sometimes that people set make you feel like you should be doing that. But sometimes you will be lazy. Sometimes you will just want to doodle sometimes you'll want to just walk around or yeah listen to techno like just i think be patient with yourself is the best advice i could possibly give and just relax a little bit more into it and it's amazing what happens when you do that so that's, that's right my that's right. thank you so much lauren and thanks everybody thanks for, for listening me. see you again at the next episode of productivity mastery bye all